Hello, my name is Dr. Tim Sandal, and it's a great pleasure to be with you today. And today we're going to be talking about contamination control. And I've subtitled this presentation as Back to Basics. And the reason for doing that, I think it's really useful if we can remind ourselves about the main risk factors, vectors of contamination, the way we as people behave in clean rooms and controlled environments, as well as some of the important aspects of monitoring that we need to take on board. And so I'm going to begin with people because people are essential for the manufacture of pharmaceutical products. So we are needed in order to operate complex machinery, to clean and disinfect, to review batches, release batches and so on. But the kind of important aspect is the interactions of people within clean rooms and controlled environments. So we can design clean rooms to be highly effective using um, high efficiency particular air filters and designing clean rooms with pressure differentials and with uh, high air change rates and good recovery times. But the people factor is a relatively un predictable aspect that we can introduce into the process and can lead to contamination. So clean rooms are essential for the manufacture of pharmaceuticals. And these are rooms that are subject to specially controlled environments. And we determine the cleanliness of a clean room by measuring the concentration of airborne particles within a given volume, and that volume is typically one cubic meter of air. And we don't know whether those particles are inert or whether they are carrying microorganisms. So very few microorganisms are free floating within um, clean rooms. Most are attached, attached to other particles, often rafts of skin matter. So it's very important that we achieve a cleanliness class and then we control this level of cleanliness. Now, contamination sources within clean rooms, according to industry surveys, are that people are the primary source of contamination, accounting for over two thirds of the contamination. And we know that by the types of microorganisms that we detect through monitoring programs, which are those organisms in close association with the human skin microbiota. That's organisms that are resident or transient to human skin. And this is often a abundance of gram positive organisms, the micrococcaceae and coriniforms in particular. We also have a certain level of organisms from water, depending upon the type of clean room and the activities that are going on. And water uh, presents a double conundrum because water is a vector of contamination. So it can spread contamination through aerosols or people walking through puddles and so on. But for a large number of gram negative organisms, then water provides the necessary mechanism for initiating cell division. So we have microbial growth as well. And then also we have the added risk of the release of endotoxin from um, damaged or dying gram negative bacteria. We also have an element of contamination spreading from poorly designed air systems or weak ventilation systems as well. Then uh, surfaces at a given period of time will be contaminated. So after they've been effectively cleaned and disinfected, the contamination rates are very low but they can build up again over time. Now, microorganisms attached to surfaces are only going to present a problem if that surface is a critical surface, or if myself as a human, then touch a one surface and then say, don't practice um, glove sanitization, or I'm transferring a tool or something, and I go to a more critical area. So we get that contamination transfer risk as well. And leading into transfer as well, there's an element of risk from the transfer of items into and out of clean rooms. So the whole 
uh, clean room transfer disinfection control, having various layers of wrapping for, say, single use sterile disposable consumables, and removing wrapping and practicing disinfection through each stage of the going through the clean room cascade. So as you move from, say, uh, external environment to, uh, say, a, a controlled but non classified CMC area, then maybe through grade C and then into grade B. So we're working our way through those various layers. Now, risks from people has been enhanced through our understanding of the Human Microbiome Project. So the Human Microbiome Project was an exercise undertaken by the US Department of Health, um, 2008 to 2013, and it was characterizing the typical microorganisms on people of different ages, uh, different gender, uh, living in different locales, um, and across the whole body, inside and, and outside. And what's of interest to us for clean room contamination control is the organisms carried on the outer layers of, of the skin foremost, or what might be associated with the eyes, nose, nares, and, and, and the mouth, um, if we're not effectively gowned. We also know that um, as well as microbial risks, then people also present other risks. So um, skin, for example, will shed at different rates for different people. And that can be a factor of things like exposure to sun or using particular um, uh, shower gels and soaps and things like that. And also the time of day that people wash and th there's various factors that are uh, different to a number of people due to variations in physiology. We also have a no cosmetics um, rule for clean rooms, and that's because of the sheer abundance of particles that are, are generated from various cosmetics. Um, when we talk, we release moisture, and sometimes we can produce lots of spittle. So uh, effective mask control is important there. Um, clothing, even clean room clothing, can produce uh, occasional fibres and things, so that's another contamination risk, as is hair. Um, as is touching, and also the speed of movements as well. So the reason that we need to encase people in appropriate clean room clothing, and the reason that an important aspect of contamination control is with practicing good gowning techniques, is due to this number of microorganisms from different regions and niches of the human body. And there's a person on the screen, and then there are different locations that are highlighted with different numbers of microorganisms. So you can see that the um, scalp, the hairline, um, contains a million organisms. A lot of these are um, <clears throat> anaerobic organisms of um, the, the, the genre uh, Propionibacterium or Cutibacterium. Um, and then we get variations, so uh, the warmer, moister areas, like under the arms, we're going to be getting up to, say, 10 million microorganisms, whereas in the sort of drier areas, say, on the back, then we're getting lower levels. So there's different risk factors from different parts in the body. And there's also different types of microorganisms as well. So, for example, with fungi, the highest concentration of fungi is found on the heel of the foot. For example, the highest concentration of gram negatives will be found in the groin area. The greatest abundance of gram positives is on the body torso and on the um, arms and hands. Um, we can also um, spread high numbers of microorganisms through sneezing and coughing. And there's a, uh, a slow motion picture of someone sneezing on the slide there. And the typical sneeze can go several meters. So there are various risk factors there that we need to take into account. And we've already mentioned that uh, touching transfer metric that we need to be careful of as well. Um, and also, the important people aspects are also picked up in regulations. So if we look at EU GMP and we look at Annex 1, then there's a, a line there that says you know, people are variable. But how variable are they are and how well we can control them depends on the nature of the skills training that we impart and the attitudes of the personnel as well, the degree that they fit in with the uh, culture of quality, for example. And then we have the FDA, where the 2004 FDA aseptic filling guidance 
places an emphasis upon um, the importance of asepsis, aseptic technique, of preventing the person from contaminating uh, product or the, or the environment in general. Further with people and risks, so again, some statistics on the slide there. So um, the average person is shedding over 1,000 million um, skin cells or skin deratrus uh, per day. And work by people like Bill White using bioaerosol chambers have shown us that around 10% of these um, skin particles will be carrying microorganisms, or microorganisms are at least culturable. Um, the balance is slightly greater with men. Um, and uh, you may find that with um, changing rooms when you look at patterns of uh, male and female changing rooms, for example. So clean room clothing, if we go to a clean room clothing supplier who is reputable, be that relaundered or disposable um, clothing, and it's appropriate for the particular grade, then we can see considerable reductions in contamination based on the type of clothing um, worn. So instantly putting on a clean room suit cuts down the release of particles of around 0.5 micron by 50%. And but that infers wearing gowns correctly and there needs to be time limits on gowns. So some examples on there. If we're going into an aseptic filling area, then typically we want to be changing the gown every four hours, but we're probably giving the operators a break due to the high disciplines of having to stand like that a lot of the time and not moving very much and so on. So it kind of coincides with that. Whereas for lower grade clean rooms, we can perhaps replace the gown once per day because we're wearing that gown over, uh, say, clean room smocks for going through a controlled but non-classified area change, for example. But we still need to behave correctly because um, we need to be healthy. So the good advice is, again, for contamination control, is that anyone with a respiratory infection should not be going into a clean room. So somebody with a cold, nose running, coughing example, should not be going in. Neither should somebody with an upset stomach. And there may be other rules that we want to apply as well. So if someone come back from hot country and there's evidence of skin peeling, again, you're going to increase that shedding risk. So they shouldn't be going automatically into the clean room. If people are on antibiotics, then a number of antibiotics can disrupt the microbiome and also the skin microbiota, and that can sometimes lead to increased shedding as well. So personnel would report they're on an antibiotic and then some kind of assessment should be made. And again, um, tapping into sort of pop cultural aspects, um, people have had recently had piercings or tattoos, then again, you need to make sure that the wounds have healed from both and that there's no weeping or blood or anything like that, that might compromise the clean room suit. Um, and with tattoos in particular, we need to take care because many tattoos take two to three weeks to heal and they are obviously uh, deliberate damage to the, to the skin. Some also itch, which then causes people to um, scratch and also some react with sunlight as well, particularly uh, red and purple um, tattoos as well can cause greater irritation and a enhanced reaction as well. And we covered um, uh, piercings, but also we don't want people to have nail extensions going to clean rooms because they can often pierce the, the gloves. Same with hair extensions as well. And also tanning can also disrupt the skin as well. So lots of factors to take into account to make sure that we're getting that maximum control and maximum protection. And we also need to be careful of smoking and vaping as well, because if somebody's just um, smoked or vaped and they go straight into a clean room, then again, research shows that the uh, efficacy of the mask reduces uh, by 50% straight off. So you need to wait for a period of time and this is because the shin abundance of particles that are being released are just so much higher after smoking or vaping. So normally, um, if people need a nicotine fix, then they would go in the rest area, take that, and then they'd wait a period of, say, 20 minutes after taking their last inhalation before 
challenge in the full gowning process. Uh, contamination by transfer, we mentioned, is, is quite a big issue. So the importance here, operators will be wearing gloves in clean rooms. It's important that um, they double glove in aseptic areas, that their gloves are inspected, and that the hands are subject to regular disinfection, and that disinfection has been qualified in some way, either at the facility or based on manufacturer's data, take into account the type of glove as well and how easy it is to spread the hand disinfectant, which will often be 70% isopropyl alcohol to gloves across the whole surface of the glove. And that can often typically be um, 30 to 60 seconds. And that technique needs to be good. So doing things like working in the fingers, rubbing the thumbs on the palm of the hand, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a rigorous all over action. We mentioned about the way people move and behave in clean rooms is another factor taken into account for contamination control. And we can see on the slide there, differences in particle release and deposition into the potential onto surfaces from being motionless through to slow walking to very fast walking. And this becomes an important factor, particularly when people are um, in aseptic areas. And um, this is for the same class of clean room suit throughout these different levels. And this is relatively old research. It goes back to a, a paper published in uh, 1965 when the um, uh, pioneering work into clean rooms were being um, conducted in the US. Um, again, just a reference there to sneezing, coughing and, and talking. Uh, Swedish research has shown that um, there's high numbers of particles that are produced and a number of these will be carrying um, viable microorganisms. So it's quite a good slide to use in a training session if you've got new starters and so on, just to show the importance of um, mass control, particularly keeping in um, Staphylococcus aureus, which can be an abundance around the nares and the streptococcal organisms that can be residing in the mouth or in the back of the throat. Cosmetics also mentioned, and, and again, we have some um, research here from uh, Scottish researchers, and you can see there the, the very, very high numbers of particles that are released from makeup, which is why there's no requirement that all personnel remove makeup when entering a clean room, irrespective of the class of that clean room. And so we covered the uh, Human Microbiome Project, but that has um, perhaps given new um, credence to um, the importance of gowning. Uh, so when a new starter joins a facility, then they should be like practicing gowning maybe 10 times before they even attempt to go into the clean room because you really want to have that control. The gown doesn't touch the floor, people are not shedding. They're conscious of what they're carrying on their bodies. And then particularly of some of the microbial niches as well. And this kind of helps to emphasize why, say, going into aseptic areas, there should be no exposed um, skin. And again, we have US research that shows um, different types of microorganisms, different microbial populations, found in relation to different parts of the body. And this kind of information can also be quite useful for when undertaking root cause analysis into a microbial contamination deviation, because the types of organisms might offer, if we believe them to come from the person, which readers of the body are um, of the greatest risk in, in any particular activity. Um, again, we've spoken about the risks of shedding and the variations with people, but just their interesting points is that the typical size of skin flakes, the numbers that are produced um, at such a rate that we replace the entire outer layer of our skin every four days. And as I mentioned, about 10% of these are going to be rafts carrying viable microorganisms. If they land in a certain location, then we have a contamination control problem. So we need to put a great emphasis in terms of our controls on protecting um, our products and processes from people. 
So we wrap people up in appropriate gowning and give them the appropriate training. And also we put localised protection around critical activities. So um, this might be um, unidirectional airflow devices for um, early stage processing, or when we move to um, aseptic facilities, then these may well be closed ramps, restrictive access barrier systems, where it's a sealed system with unidirectional airflow, which is air of grade A quality coming through in uh, one direction and coming out with a velocity between 0.45 meters per second, plus or minus 20%. Or we use a fully enclosed isolator, which will have its own biodecontamination system, such as vapor phase, hydrogen peroxide. And again, it's important to remind staff about personal hygiene. So that's the basics of, um, of good personal um, cleanliness. And then also about washing hands before they go into um, clean rooms as well. And if they notice things like dry skin, about reporting that to a supervisor and then undertaking various exercises with different um, cleaning agents uh, in order to try and address that, that skin dryness issue. Um, so we just talked a lot about control, about clean room control factors and people control factors and material movement control factors. Environmental monitoring is also really important, but the key thing to get across is that environmental monitoring is going to be undertaken once we have good control. There's no value in undertaking environmental monitoring where we have weak control systems. So we're really looking that are we maintaining our control systems. And we then assess the data by looking at long periods of time for trends using appropriate alert and action levels, and then assessing this all through a rigorous environmental monitoring program. And we get a good balance of methods and techniques. So we look at contamination in the air, so we may look at the way the air moves by, say, undertaking airflow visualization studies and then um, using active air samplers to assess the number of organisms of given volumes of air and then using saddle plates in key locations to indicate the likelihood of contamination deposition. We also need to assess um, contamination on surfaces through the use of contact plates and swabs and also undertake personnel monitoring as well. So we have the classic monitoring techniques then of subtle plates, active or volumetric air samplers, contact plate swabs, particle counters, which will assess the overall numbers of particles in the air. And then there are various rapid microbiological monitoring methods emerging, ranging from bioluminescent swabs to spectrophotometric counters. And I've got a spotlight Spectrophotometric counters as one example of a rapid microbiological method. So these are based on advances in light scattering and optics using special software and special sensors. And these types of counters can tell us whether the particles in the air are inert or biologic. And they tell us whether the particles are also biologic by looking for markers like NADH and riboflavin, and also DPA, which is the <clears throat> acid that helps to form the bacterial spores as well. And if these metabolites are present, they fluoresce and you get additional readings. So this is the kind of technology that um, is giving us greater knowledge about our levels of, of control. So we're at the cusp in some ways of this technological wave that is going to help us understand contamination better. Now, in terms of some of the essentials in environmental monitoring, let's touch on these um, briefly. Um, but we should determine where we're going to monitor, how often we're going to monitor. And we need to look at certain factors that are going to help us determine the frequencies. We know for aseptic processing, monitoring must be continuous. But for other types of clean rooms, 
you might want to do ambient rooms more often than cold rooms, rooms with open processing more often than closed processing, and so on. We need to look at process flows, where does equipment go, where do people go, to help us determine where we're going to monitor and what's the most appropriate sample. So techniques like hazard analysis and critical control points, or HACCP, can be very effective for helping to determine monitoring locations. And we decide who's going to take the samples, because we may want to restrict the numbers of people within an aseptic area. We also undertake um, data analysis and microbial identification, and also to make sure that we're robustly investigating um, contamination results, undertaking root cause analysis, and setting appropriate corrective and preventative actions. And we also uh, need to um, make sure from our monitoring of gowns and finger plates of, of personnel that we are satisfied that um, the clothing clothing's appropriate and it's maintaining a proper uh, level of integrity as well. And this might lead us to make some changes, looking at undersuits, to um, assessing the temperature control, so we want to minimise the likelihood of operators perspiring. And for things like changing rooms, we probably want to increase the number of air change rates quite substantially. So we're getting more of a flush over the operators of clean air. And also determining if we are recycling suits, how often we can recycle them and whether we're going to permit any kind of garment repair policy. So it's very important for those who are focused on contamination control within a facility to have a good understanding of clean room gowns, as well as the environmental monitoring program, and as well as clean room design. And just an example there of, of how uh, garments can vary. This is an example of a good quality garment, and you can see there an electron micrograph of a good weave with, um, and that's at 180 magnification. Um, it's also important that we look at uh, re-laundered and um, versus reusable gowns and do, do an appropriate um, cost benefit analysis as well. So you know, they're all important factors to um, consider there. There's always going to be a balance to be struck with um, the ability of the gown, because the gown is, is in many ways a filter to retain contamination offset against operator comfort. And it's important to ensure we are approaching contamination control around the operator by having the appropriate types of gowns to the appropriate area as well. And the higher grade areas, then it's the aspect also mentioned earlier about not having any exposed skin as well. So it's fully covered. And also we know in the revised Annex 1, there's a requirement to wear full face goggles as well, which I'm sure most facilities have been doing. But it's very much like the picture on the slide. It's that full barrier around the person. Um, it's also important that gowns worn in aseptic areas have been sterilised, and these can be sterilised either by autoclaving or by a process like gamma radiation as well. And that the SOPs that are describing that gown process have been written with a sufficient level of um, description, but also with a good level of clarity. Uh, photographs are a good idea as well, and as I also mentioned, lots of practicing as well. And encouraging operators that if the gown becomes wet or it becomes damaged in any shape or form, then um, the operator will exit the area and go through a regowning process. It's important as well for contamination control that the audit of the um, gown provider is undertaken and that a number of factors are assessed there about you know, whether the uh, gown provider is undertaking particle counting 
of the gown through the, thing, the, the, the drum test, and that the sterilization has been proven not to uh, lead to damage of the gown over time, or that the number of times a gown could be relaundered for has been assessed and based on the irradiation process, which is a very harsh process, and also the rigors of the <coughs> washing process as well. Um, the other thing about the gown repair policy that we mentioned was about um, fixing holes where the holes are permitted. Often in CND, they might be in aseptic areas, they rarely are. And then assessing the maximum wear times that we've also spoken about. And also ensuring that suits are packed in the appropriate way. So that when the suit is unwrapped, you don't just like spring out and go all over the floor. Um, we want to unwrap in a way that the operator can control holding the arms and the legs and put on that suit without the suit material hitting the floor of the cleaner. And many garment providers will adapt um, appropriately according to the needs of the customer in relation to um, the way the suit is wrapped and packaged. Um, and we have the good changing practices that we've um, also spoken about, but just to reinforce those here, about removal of, of makeup, reporting in illnesses, and then going through a well-designed gown area with good air change rates, or possibly the use of an air shower, where the gowned operator is flushed with rapid flow of, of air. We also need to control the numbers of people present because the more people get packed into a changing area, then the greater the risk of cross-contamination. So we should have a rationale, a risk-based approach, ideally based on some monitoring data to help us to establish the maximum numbers of people we are allowed in a clean room changing area at any one time. And for aseptic areas to further minimise the contamination control and the crisscrossing between people, is that we want to have separate entry and exit routes. Um, it's also important to um, have the defined procedures, which is an example on the slide, but also to have something that helps to control contamination that are on the feet, because although clean room shoes may be worn at different changing processes and things, it's quite easy to trampoline contamination. So, we may use sticky mats or we might use polymeric flooring. Generally, polymeric flooring has been found to be more effective for a contamination control approach than a sticky mat. For one reason, at least because the sticky mat has to be pulled up, which releases particles, whereas the polymeric flooring does not. And it can be tackled with a straightforward detergent. Having effective gown training as well is really important for um, understanding the contamination of the operator, particularly for trainees. So video recording, showing the trainee what they're doing and then matching that with a video or say best practice. Using observational checklists and then ensuring that we're undertaking environmental monitoring at the point of um, the gown training and then for periodic gown qualifications, which would typically be every six months. So here we may we'll use saddle plates to show what might be deposited through the gown process, um, suit contact plates um, after the, the gowning exercise, and also ensuring that the um, finger plates are done so we know whether the operator has an effective glove sanitization technique as well. Face masks are of great importance. So we need to specify the correct face mask with the correct bacterial efficiency rating and the correct pressure hold. So typically we want to have masks with a bacterial efficiency rating of 97, 98%. Um, and also to ensure that the mask is not gonna be a source of fibers, not gonna disperse fibers because we don't want fibers to end up in the pharmaceutical product because that then becomes an impurity. Um, they also need to have adequate filtration, so capturing the contamination, but also to allow the operator to breathe. 
and that they fit appropriately as well. And although we're not going to wear um, normal glasses into a, into a clean room, probably probably have prescription clean room glasses, but a good um, way of checking how tight a mask fits properly is to put the mask on to have glasses, and the glasses should not be steaming up. If the glasses are steaming up, the mask is not fitted. And again, for aseptic facilities, we need to make sure that the masks are sterile and have been subjected to a sterilization process using gamma radiation or ethylene oxide. Gloves. So gloves need to be um, safe. So they need to provide um, protection from any chemicals that might be present. Uh, they need to be uh, designed in a way they're not gonna cause uh, skin irritations with the personnel. And they must be powder free because again that presents a risk to the product. They should have good physical strength. Um, they should be able to be subjected to the hand disinfection procedure and again they should be sterile for aseptic areas. Um, we also need to understand whether the glove will affect hand sanitization practices. So there may be differences between um, applying disinfectant to bare hands and to gloved hands. And typically we'll be using different disinfectants anyway, because um, we we'll often be using 70% um, IPA to the gloved hand. We can't do that to bare hands because that will dry the skin and may cause dermatitis. So we'll use things like um, industrial methylated spirit or denatured ethanol instead. Um, and some products are gonna be better than others. And also we want to make sure we're not going to get a reaction from the glove. We don't want anything to leach out the surface of the glove that might cause a problem. We need to apply these principles as well to where we're using barrier systems and we have um, gauntlets in place as well. And additionally, we want to make sure that the integrity of gauntlets is assessed as well. So we might use a glove leak tester or we might use something like the water intrusion test. So it's so important that um, all of the clean room um, apparel is suitable for the operator to wear. We don't want things to be the wrong size. We don't want gloves to be too big or clean room suits to be too big or too tight either. If clean room suits are too big, for example, then you get a billowing effect and you can produce a greater quantity of particles. In some cases, we may well specify anti-static properties because that has a slight repulsion effect for microbial carrying particles. So there's a lot of elements that need to be taken and put into the clean room contamination um, system. And that clean room contamination system would then form part of the wider contamination control strategy, which is going to be a Annex 1 requirement. We still have these uh, personnel risks that we need to be um, mindful of. And I did a study a few years ago, but it looked like a 10 year window of the types of microorganisms that are found in clean rooms. And it then tried to associate these organisms with particular body parts as well. So I found uh, particular risks with hands, unsurprisingly, with mask control, um, around sometimes around the forehead and also with the feet. And it's those particular microbial patterns that you can begin to build up um, particular profiles of risk factors. It's also very important to ensure that we're trending the personnel monitoring to ensure that we've assessed gowns, um, exit plates and finger plates and using that data to react to problems where we can find them. Exit suit plates as well are quite important and it's important to try and standardize the exit suit um, plate tests as well. So we need to understand which locations are we going to do and why are we going for those locations. So we particularly may want to focus on the arms, but maybe the torso, certainly the mask. So how many locations? How are we selected those locations? And then what measures of control are we producing to ensure consistency of sampling? So 
How long will the contact plate remain in contact with the gown for? What degree of pressure might we apply? And then also to have the important practice embedded that as soon as those plates are taken, that the, that's always done on exit, and then the gown is then removed because the taking of the contact plate breaches the gown integrity. So just some examples there are some of the locations that can be um, selected. Uh, from my experience, the top of the head tends to be the location that records the highest number of um, contaminants. And also um, uh, men and women as, as well, there are differences. And uh, I wrote an article uh, a little while ago for European Pharmaceutical Review, which was looking at a whole strategy and rationale for um, these locations and frequencies and monitorings and approaches and the types of organisms and so on. So hopefully that could act as a good reference point for you. Um, so when we get data and we want to revisit our personnel controls, then again, finger plate and exit suit data can be quite interesting. So it allows us to have a look at what activities people might have been undertaking, um, have they just recently been cleaning something, have an engineer had to undertake a repair, for example. Um, and then we can learn from what those contamination risks might present and the nature of operations that are permitted, the level of cleaning and disinfection that we want to undertake of the facility following these exercises. Also, we can begin to also look at a more holistic approach to contamination control. So if we find contamination um, in grade A on a surface and then have to find the same organism, say on the, an operator's finger plates and the operator, that operator was involved in the setup of the line, then have a concern that that contamination was there at setup. And more advanced microbial identification techniques such as the use of genotyping um, which is looking for things like the highly conserved regions of the microbial genome such as the 16s rna regions which we can achieve through um, technologies like riber printers for example can help us to trace those similarities and look for those patterns and to work out even going wider how contamination might have gone in with something from the point of transfer into the facility, for example. And similarly, we get information from finger plates as well. And finger plates are taken best when someone else is holding the plates. We should not take finger plates straight after hands have been sprayed because we will get false results. But equally, we need to make sure that the agar contains a neutralizer against the disinfectant that's being used, because we will always have um, disinfectant residues on the hands as well. So um, we want to ensure that we are not getting um, false negative results. It's a fairly good idea that um, quality personnel or microbiology staff come in and do things like random gown sampling and random finger plate sampling just to make sure that that independent oversight is producing comparable results from any samples that operators might be taking. It's also important to get into the habit again for our control strategy um, of ensuring that we're taking finger plates after any critical activity is performed, but also at set intervals. So an operator who's in a clean room for four hours would be sampled maybe every half an hour or something to help build up a profile of that operator. And because the act of the finger plate might leave some agar residues on the fingers, then it's important that um, disinfection happens straight after the plates have been taken. But again, never immediately before the plates are taken. So we'll have good data. Now we mentioned um, gauntlets. But um, gauntlets um, for, um, should be sampled straight after they've been used. An operator puts their hand in the gauntlet to carry manipulation. We should sample that and we should assess the gauntlets for integrity. And we need to do that, again, linking back to Annex 1. Annex 1 requires that the uh, frequency of changing gauntlets is in the contamination control strategy and tied to real data. 
And the best data we can gather is data from the integrity test. And there's other good behavioral practices as well, as well as uh, the speed of walking and so on. And one is that if anything ever falls to the floor or goes to an area that's less clean, and the floors are always going to be less clean, and that's because um, most clean rooms are designed that the air will come through the ceiling, circulates, may will hit the floor and then be pulled through extracts. And so we're going to be a lot more likely to get contamination deposition on the floor. So picking anything up on the floor is it should not be permitted during uh, product processing and should be left to the end of the shift when that product process has been completed. And I've seen some um, uh, quite bad contamination events from things that picked up on floor. Glove sanitization may not be overly effective and then there's connection to the product which can be quite serious. Um, it's also important to understand um, airflow, particularly um, in clean rooms and unidirectional airflow devices. So um, clean rooms to work properly need to have good functional extracts and the number of extracts should be um, based on uh, sound science. So that could be say using computational fluid dynamics or it could be based on um, looking at uh, airflow visualization studies, for example. So extracts should be the right number and they should not be blocked and they should always be functional. So we need to ensure we've got that consistency of air movement and air replacement. And the unidirectional airflow devices as described, which is air coming in one direction, very, very rapid velocity, creating this curtain of clean air. But it's important to understand that if an operator needs to interact with that, then um, if they're going to break first air, and first air is a reference to whatever the air is touching first, so if it's now touching the operator, that there is no exposed product or product vials in the area, or if there is, then that is deemed to be reject and the line is cleared. So again, good training, showing operators um, airflow visualization patterns, and what happens when the first air is broken is of, um, great importance as well. Cleaning and disinfection are also of great fundamental importance to the contamination control strategy. So there's a difference between detergents and disinfectants. Detergents will remove dirt and grease and protein and so on. And they also might help to disassociate some microorganisms from the surface, which can be quite useful. And that's because microorganisms that adhere to a surface are harder to kill with a disinfectant than those that are disassociated or in a, in a sort of more planktonic state. Um, it's important with disinfectants that we're using those at the right concentration and for the right contact time. The contact time is the time required for the disinfectant to hit the microbial cell surface and penetrate that surface and then to destroy the cell. Disinfectants should be two different disinfectants of different modes of efficacy used in rotation. And we know the revision to Annex 1 also speaks of the additional requirement to have a sporicide and also for that sporicide to be used at a qualified frequency. So this all comes into the disinfectant field trial concept that's quite important. Another important part is technique as well. So things like when an operator goes into a clean room, they would do um, ceilings first because that might dislodge certain things and then walls, finally floors and doing floors in a way that it's always from the back of the room towards the room exit. So there's no crisscrossing. Um, the disinfection of surfaces is also really important. Um, and typically it's one side of a wipe in one stroke. And then there's a refold of that wipe. And for a typical clean room wipe, it's possible to do that four times. So we talk about the four fold wipe technique. So coming to the end of this um, webinar. Um, and what I wanted to focus on were some of the important points of an effective contamination control strategy, focusing foremost on people, because as one of my earlier slides said, is that people are counting for 70% of the contamination found within um, clean rooms. Um, so how people 
move, what they wear, what they do before they go into the clean room are all of great fundamental importance. We've also looked at clean room design principles as well, particularly about unidirectional airflow, room air change rates, pressure differentials, and so on. Um, and we also need to ensure that um, we are cleaning and disinfection, disinfecting appropriately, and also that we have a sound environmental monitoring regime that is risk-based and can pick up the various sources of contamination. And all of that should be um, supported by periodic qualification. So we're looking at data, we're looking at microorganisms, we're looking at results from people and from the clean room environment. And also that we're auditing regularly that quality staff are going in and checking that everything is being done correctly as well. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I hope this um, presentation has been interesting. There's been a few thought provoking uh, points thrown in around the contamination control space. And that some of this can help you to develop your contamination control strategy uh, that you need to put into place to meet the requirements of the revised EU GMP Annex 1. So I'm Tim Sandal, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy the other presentations that will be coming through today. So thank you very much and goodbye.